Hello and welcome to the news at when, when, 1984, where you are always being watched. By whom you ask? Why, Big Brother, of course. Just kidding. It's not the news. It's just the first episode of this new series of podcasts revolving around George Orwell's famous novel that has recently seen a rise in popularity. Of course, it's 1984. This episode, we'll be discussing the general atmosphere portrayed in the book, as well as the important terms you need to know to understand the story. Beginning with the atmosphere. I can practically hear Shostakovich's 11th symphony playing in the background. <laughs> but all jokes aside, Orwell manages to create an ominous, dark, gloomy and oppressive feeling right from the first page. The first line, even. The clocks are striking thirteen, as a feeble, sickly man limps up the stairs to his broken-down apartment building in former London, England, now Airstrip 1 in Oceania. We are introduced to the contraptions called telescreens almost immediately, which makes the reader uncomfortable imagining being in the same position. Telescreens are an invention of Orwell for this novel and function essentially as spying equipment with the ability to see and hear everything you do. One of the party slogans being, Big Brother is watching you. The party being, of course, the main government body, with Big Brother as its head. Another of their slogans is, War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength, which sums up the basis of what the civilization is built up on. Contradictions. This leads us to another special word, that being doublethink. Doublethink is a concept in which one must accept two contradictory beliefs as correct simultaneously. The reason for this technique is the existence of the thought police, an alleged organization who can gain access to thoughts and check if someone is committing thought crime. That is the act of thinking something that goes against the party. These strange words and concepts exist in the new language of Oceania called Newspeak. It was created so people would not even have the vocabulary or ability to go against the party. The last important phrase that needs to be explained is the two-minute hate. It is a sort of ritual where a film of the party's enemy, Emmanuel Goldstein, is shown to have hate directed at, although Goldstein does not truly exist. Just observing all the things the government has in place to ensure its rule is incredibly unsettling, and the intricate attention to world building on Orwell's part really adds to the entirety of the atmosphere. On that note, I should address the way the government and civilization is built up. Of course, I've already said Big Brother is at the top of the pyramid, and below him is the party. The party is split into the inner and outer party whereby the inner party only makes up 6% of the population. Outside of the party are the proletarians, proles for short, who make up 85% of the population. They generally have more freedom than party members. Additionally, there are four ministries, the Ministry of Love, Truth, Peace and Plenty, each dealing with the opposite of their titles. The main protagonist works in the Ministry of Truth, altering documents. Overall, the novel gives off a very depressing vibe. It strips us of hope and shoves the hard reality of the world into our faces, leaving us wondering how our main character will deal with the situation. But in a world where even vices like alcohol and smoking don't help, it's hard to imagine anything better. Well, dear listeners, that was a lot of information this episode. Although there's still some missing. But I hope you'll tune in to listen to the next episode where we'll finally get to the actual plot and take a look at our protagonist, who I've kept oh so mysterious this episode. Thanks for listening, and until next time, goodbye, comrade. Hello and welcome to the second episode of the podcast series revolving around George Orwell's 1984. 
Last time, I talked a bit about the general atmosphere and described the setting while explaining important terms. This episode, I'll be giving a summary of the plot and I'll be characterizing the main protagonist, Winston Smith. Hopefully, I can fill you in on the information I left out last time. So let's get into it. Of course, the story begins with some basic exposition. We're introduced to Winston, the main character, where he lives, Victory Mansions, Airstrip 1, Oceania, where he works, the Ministry of Truth, and the general setting, which was established in the last episode. Because of the circumstances of living in such an oppressive society, Winston decides to start a diary, despite knowing that being found out means death. And being found out isn't exactly difficult with all the telescreens around and people spying. One day, during the two-minute hate, Winston notices two people that stand out to him. One is O'Brien, an inner party member, and the other is Julia from the fiction department. He believes the former to be an ally and the latter an enemy. To his surprise, he meets Julia again a few days later, who slips him a note secretly that reads, I love you. Following this, they meet up in secret many times to be alone. While alone, they make love and partake in other illegal activities. At some point, Winston manages to rent a room above the antique shop he first bought his diary from, and he and Julia fall in love despite knowing they will be caught. Eventually, Winston is able to meet with O'Brien in his apartment where he confesses to be a part of the Brotherhood, O'Brien that is. The Brotherhood is an alleged secret organization whose goal is to bring down the party, its head being Emmanuel Goldstein. Winston and Julia join the Brotherhood and are given a copy of the book written by Emmanuel Goldstein, the Manifesto of the Brotherhood. While Winston reads the book to Julia back in their rented room, soldiers suddenly barge in to arrest them and it is revealed the store owner was a member of the Thought Police all along. As Julia and Winston are separated, they are taken to the Ministry of Love, which we know from the last episode deals with the opposite of what it's called. Here it is revealed that O'Brien was also a spy for the party and planned to trap him by making him commit a rebellious act openly. Winston is tortured and brainwashed for months by O'Brien but manages to resist and struggle for a long while. He is eventually sent to the dreaded room 101 where he must confront his worst fear, that being rats. Winston has a cage of rats strapped to his head that are prepared to eat his face. At this point, Winston snaps and tells O'Brien to do it to Julia instead, betraying her in the process. Having reached his goal, O'Brien lets Winston go. Winston becomes fully indoctrinated by the party and even though he meets Julia by chance once more, they have both changed and no longer love each other. The book ends with Winston stating he loves Big Brother. (coughs) That's it for the plot. Hopefully you could follow along easily enough. But now I'm going to get into the characterization of Winston Smith. Some information can already be gathered just from hearing the plot. Starting with physical traits. Winston is a 39 year old man with very fair hair, rough skin and a naturally sanguine face. He is described to have a smallish frail figure and a meager body. This can probably be attributed to his poor diet whereby he skips meals, which also indicates him not having much money. Additionally, he has a varicose ulcer above his right ankle, which causes him to have to walk slowly. Adding to that, he seems to be somewhat of an alcoholic and drinks copious amounts of victory gin and smokes tobacco too, which makes him overall very physically unhealthy. He also has trouble with mandatory morning exercises. As stated earlier, Winston works in the Ministry of Truth. Here, he alters past documents to fit the vision of the party in the present. This is one aspect in life that Winston is ambitious in as he is quite good at his job and completes it successfully. Other than that, Winston is very pessimistic, fatalistic and paranoid throughout the book. These character traits are exactly what lead to his downfall towards the end. 
When Winston commits acts of rebellion like opening a diary and writing down with Big Brother over and over or having a secret affair with Julia, he is always in a mindset that he will be inevitably caught. He considers himself a dead man walking, completely helpless. This is why he acts recklessly in his rebellion against the party. This is why he took the risk of openly confessing to O'Brien, for example. Although his rebellion may just be Winston giving himself false hope, the things he does show how much Winston cares about why the world is the way it is. He attempts to find the truth, which is in clear contrast to Julia, who rebels for selfish reasons. Winston seems to want to live in a better world overall. Winston can be interpreted as an anti-hero because of this goal. He does, after all, do some pretty courageous things to rebel. However, I personally do not feel he fulfills this role wholly because of how paranoid he is. Well, that's all I have time for this episode. I hope you enjoyed listening and will look forward to the next time where we'll discuss more current topics. Thank you for listening and until next episode. Bye-bye! Hello and welcome to the third and final episode of the podcast series about 1984. But what's this? Today's episode isn't even about the novel, says the host, flipping through her imaginary notes. Well, no, it isn't about the book directly. But rest assured, dear listener, the topic is still 1984. Today, I'll be indulging myself and commenting on why I think the novel illustrates current issues in our society. Although many people say it does so, so I'm certainly not alone. Perhaps this is also a chance to speak on behalf of those individuals. Before getting started with my comments, I think it's only fair to hear someone else's opinion first. A kind of way to test the water, let's say. So without further ado, please welcome this podcast's first and only very special guest, the well-travelled, highly opinionated book lover, yes, you guessed it, no you didn't, it's my mum. Yay, just listen to that applause, which she can't hear because this is a pre-recording. But anyway, I showed my mum a short summary of the plot of 1984 and asked her to comment on how it could reflect on our modern society. Basically, the same question as I'm answering. Here's what she had to say. Okay, so why do you think that the novel 1984 is said to illustrate um, issues in our society today? Um, I think that's the case because we have more and more technology these days that seems to monitor everything we do. It surveils what we do in our daily life, Um, things like Siri and... um, they, yeah, lots of technology that knows what we like to buy, what we what we do in our f- spare time, and um, yeah, and and there's um, political parties these days that try to to influence our minds, and it's quite hard sometimes to to filter um, which information is true or is. Um, yeah, things called like fake news and they try to influence um, um, what we do. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for answering our question and another big thank you for coming on the show. Let's give another warm round of applause for our special guest. Thank you very much. Okay, goodbye. Bye. That was some interesting insight, I definitely have to agree with those statements. Something very controversial at the moment is the invasion of privacy and data collection taking place. For example, CCTV cameras are commonplace nowadays that can observe your every move in public. I suppose they can be compared to telescreens in the novel. They're supposed to deter crime and help capture footage of criminal activity, but who can say what else they're recording and who's watching? 
The same goes for things like cookies that track your data in the internet for targeted advertising. It's impossible to know if the data that's being collected is actually being used in ways we don't know. The people in charge have access to all of our information, which is a scary concept. It's not a far stretch to the close monitoring in Oceania, and if we're not careful, things could get worse. Another thing that is scarily similar to the situation of 1984 is the way politicians often try to lie and manipulate the opinions of the public to fit their narrative. The amount of global warming deniers is outstanding, for example. At the moment, small lies and obvious lies can be kept at bay because most people possess common sense and a basic education. But big-time politicians have a lot of power and influence. They exploit the trust that is put into them to spread information that is beneficial to them, ignoring the consequences for others. The tactics used by the party in 1984 are actually not far from what some governments implement. For example, directing hate at a certain subject to push themselves into a better light, just like Big Brother and Emmanuel Goldstein. They seek control over the people so that they themselves may live an easy life. In 1984, there is a massive difference between the poor, non-party members and the ultra-rich inner party members. The rich keep getting richer and live in luxury while the poor suffer, forever trying to climb the social economical ladder only to fail. Just like in real life. It's terribly difficult for the lower class to improve their standing simply because of the way society works. It's probably too much to get into now but lower class citizens usually live in circumstances with few chances to get better jobs or education, for example, which in turn makes earning money very difficult. Additionally, many countries don't have social safety nets in place to support them. They're simply left on their own by the government to wallow in their situation. Sometimes it comes across as if the government doesn't even want them there at all because they're harder to control. It reminds me of the proles from the novel. Well, I didn't mean to end on such a dark note, but when discussing the issues in society today, it really can't be helped. It feels as if reality might be just as hopeless and depressing as what George Orwell described in his novel. With the comparisons I've drawn, I think it's crystal clear that 1984 certainly illustrates many problems we have right now. And there's definitely some I missed. I encourage all my listeners to have a good long think about this topic too. Maybe then we can all be a little more like Winston and strive to make a change. But please don't break any laws. Anyway, this brings us to the end of the podcast and with that, the end of the series. I hope you enjoyed listening to me talk and maybe I convinced those of you who haven't read the book yet to give it a shot. It's been a fun time, but now it's time to say goodbye. So, for the last time, bye-bye!